Welcome back to Chemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about how we can quantify precision. So when would this be a valid thing to do? Well, suppose we wanted to measure temperature, let's say. Okay, and if we measured the temperature of the same thing three different times, we want to make sure that all three measurements are precise. And so in this video, we're going to talk about a way we can do that, which is called calculating the parts per thousand or PPT. In the next video, we'll actually look at a Dixon Q test, and that way we'll be able to see if we have something that's imprecise, we can see if we can throw that data point out. So make sure to join us for that video as well. So first of all, what is precision? Precision is how close experimental measurements are to one another. Okay, So if we look at these two examples right here, you've probably seen these bullseyes before. Regardless of where the, the x's are, notice that in each of these two cases here, these x's are really close to one another. Okay, So in this case, we have high precision with these x's because they're very close to one another. And right here, they're very close to one another. But if we look at these right examples over here, notice that the x's are not appreciably close to one another. And so we could say that these two on the right have low precision, whereas on the left in the purple box, they have high precision. So the experimental measurements have to be close to one another. Okay. Now, here's a question for you. Which set of measurements below has the greater precision, A or B? Well, let's take a look at these. A has measurements 30.0, 29.7, 30.5, and 30.1. Those seem to cluster pretty close to 30, right? And then B is 25.3, 36.1, 30.0, and 40.0. Well, I don't really need to do any math here. I can just eyeball this. And it looks to me like A actually has the greater precision because all of these values sort of cluster closer to one another than they do in the second choice. Okay. However, it's not good enough to just eyeball things. We want to have a way to quantify this. So that's what we're going to do in this video. All right, and I'm going to be switching between the PowerPoint here and an Excel file with some data. So the first thing we need to do if we want to calculate the parts per thousand is calculate an average. And most of you probably already know how to calculate an average. If you want to calculate the average of something, we take the sum of all the values of that something and divide by the number of values. And this is going to be the average. So right here I have five data points. Okay? So the first thing I want to do is I want to actually calculate the average of these. So as you can see in the PowerPoint, we just take the sum of all the values and then divide by the number of values. Okay? So to take the average, what I'm going to do is I'm first going to take the first data point, 233.5, and then add 241.3, and then add 255.4, and then add 245.5, and then add 226.7, but then I have to divide by the number of values I'm adding. Well, I can see here there's five values, so I divide the whole thing by five. And that's going to get me an average of 240.5. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So the average is really the simplest part of this. Okay, but in order to go to the next step, we already have to know the average previously. So in the next step, we need to calculate what's called an absolute deviation. There's going to be an absolute deviation for every one of our data points. And really to calculate these absolute deviations, which are given by D, we take the absolute value of each individual data point, each individual value, minus the average that we just calculated. So let's actually look at an example. Okay. So if I want to calculate the absolute deviation, I'm going to need to calculate one for each of the data points. So I need to take the absolute value, okay, and then I'm going to take the first data point and then just subtract the average, okay? And that gives me the absolute deviation. And I'm just going to keep doing this until I've done this for all of my data points, okay? Now what you'll notice as I'm doing this is that all of the values for absolute deviation should come out positive. Okay? And if you need to understand why, you ought to think about what absolute value is. When you take the absolute value of any number, positive or negative, the answer will always come back positive. So if you had an answer that, let's say you got 233.5 minus 240.5, that answer is clearly going to be negative 7 because you're subtracting a larger number. But the absolute value makes it the positive. Okay? And so these are the absolute deviations of each of the data points. Okay? So for example, this first data point, 233.5, deviates 
uh, 7.0 away from the average. Now, so now that I've calculated all these absolute deviations, I can then go and calculate the average absolute deviation. Okay, So all I'm going to do is take the average formula that we just did and apply it to all the absolute deviations we just calculated. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to add up all the absolute deviations and then divide by the number of absolute deviations, which is still going to be 5. Okay, So I'm going to take the first one, 7.0 plus 0 0.8 plus 14.9 plus 5.0, plus 13.8, and then again divide the whole thing by 5 because there's 5 absolute deviations. And this is going to give me an average absolute deviation of 8.30. And the reason why I have it set to two decimal places here, let's think about this. So when you perform the average calculation, okay, you first determine the value of the numerator using your addition and subtraction significant digits rules. Okay, so if I want to do that, I just have to add up these numbers. So let's actually calculate the sum of all these numbers. Okay, it's 41.5. And the reason this is the correct number of significant digits is because you want to make sure that your answer has as many decimal places, so just one decimal place here, as the numbers up here with the least number of decimal places. Well, they all have one decimal place. So this is going to have one decimal place. And then if I take this 41.5, and divide by 5, 5 is an exact number, so it doesn't contribute to the number of significant digits. So in other words, when I do this division problem, I have to keep the number of significant digits the same. So I have three significant digits in that division problem, so 8.30. Okay? Um, if you're not worried about significant digits, then don't worry about that part. All right. So now we have the average absolute deviation, which is 8.30. We can then go and calculate now the parts per thousand. So what we're going to do is take the average absolute deviation, divide by the average that we calculated in the first step, and then multiply by a thousand. And one thing to make sure to remember is this is not a hundred. We're not taking a percent. That's not what we're calculating. We're multiplying by a thousand. And then we're going to see what we get and compare it to 20.0, which we'll talk about in a minute. So to calculate the parts per thousand, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the average absolute deviation, which is 8.30. I'm going to divide by the average that we initially calculated, 240.5, close parentheses, and then multiply by 1,000. Again, not 100. And my parts per thousand is going to be 34.5. Okay, So what does that mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, I always come back and I compare the parts per thousand that I obtain to 20.0. And the rule is, if your parts per thousand is less than 20.0, that means you have good precision. If your parts per thousand is greater than 20.0, it's indicative of not so good precision. And the higher the number is, the worse the precision is. Okay, So because when we did this calculation, we got 34.5, that's greater than 20.0. And so we can conclude that our precision was not so good in this data set. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. So let's just do a brief review of everything that we talked about in this video. Remember what precision is. It's how ex close experimental measurements are to one another. Okay. And we can't just eyeball it and say, oh, those are precise, so those are not precise. We have to quantify it. And so the way we do it is we calculate a parts per thousand and compare it back to 20.0. To do that, we first calculate the average of all the numbers. Then we calculate each individual absolute deviation and then take the average of those absolute deviations. And then to calculate the parts per thousand, we take the average absolute deviation and divide by our initial average and then multiply by 1,000. And if our parts per thousand is less than 20.0, it's good precision. If it's greater than 20.0, we have not so good precision or even bad precision. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. In the next video, as I mentioned at the start, we're going to do a Dixon Q test, which is going to allow us to determine if we have imprecise data, if we can actually throw out the imprecise data point. Sometimes uh, we can actually discard one of the data points to make our data a little more sound. This test is going to allow us to determine that. So join us in the next video when we cover that. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.